As a lifelong environmentalist, I'm keenly aware of how lucky I am to be able to work to protect and restore a region so incredibly rich in biological diversity, in wild places, and in functional ecosystems as the northwestern corner of California. But I've watched with rising concern the increasing production of marijuana in this quadrant of the state, and like a lot of folks, wondered about the impacts on the things that I'm here to protect. And I ask three questions about these impacts that I want to share with you today. One is, what are they? Two is, why do they matter? Are they really significant? Do they hurt things we really care about? And three is, what can we do about them? And that means, I think, asking not only what are the actions and the practices that lead to different kinds of impacts, but also, what are the structures of rules, the laws and regulations, but also the incentives and expectations that shape our actions and our practices and lead to all those impacts? And I want to look at these questions through the eyes of three of the extraordinary species we share this region with. Uh, the first is the southern torrent salamander. Now, like all of these species, the salamander was pushed really to the brink of extinction by the impacts of the logging and mining and development booms of the 20th century. And it's only because they were pushed to the edge that they're at risk now of being driven over the edge by the impacts of the marijuana boom today. The torrent salamander lives in Headwaters Creeks, high up in a narrow band of our coastal forests. And think about this guy. He's living in one such stream, but it's dried up because a grower has diverted the spring that feeds the stream to fill his water tanks. Now, if the grower knew that the salamander needed their habitat back, he could pretty easily install more water storage and fill it up with our abundant winter rains to use during the long dry season. Um, that's great. A little education, some voluntary action, problem solved. If it were that easy to solve all of our problems, I probably wouldn't be here today, though. This is coho salmon. They're the most sensitive of our remaining species of salmon. They need cold, clean water, and they need it all year round because their young have to spend a year in fresh water before they can migrate to the sea to mature. Unfortunately, the young these fish produce will face a gauntlet of compounding impacts. It starts with erosion. Sites like this one, which went in just in the last couple of years, generate through bad logging, poor grading practices, and bad road design and maintenance, a slew of mud that can flow into our streams and when it hits salmon nests, bury the eggs and smother them. If the eggs survive, they face threats from fertilizers, which any fertilizer, too much nutrient, can promote algal blooms and deprive the water of oxygen the fish need to breathe too. But worse yet, many of the cheaper kinds of fertilizer that some folks are using are based on copper compounds. Now, copper kills a salmon's sense of smell. A baby salmon that can't smell can't eat. If it can't, grow, can't eat, it can't grow. If it doesn't grow, it won't successfully go to the ocean and come back and won't make any more baby salmon. Similarly, people who are using g diesel generators to power grow lights have too often spilled their diesel into the creek which kills the bugs the fish need to feed on. Other growers, maybe the same growers, dump their used soil on the river bars. It's a cheap and anonymous way to get rid of it. The winter rains flush it out. What's the big deal? Well, the pesticides many people are using to control the spider mites that attack pot monocultures are incredibly hazardous to salmon. They really knock them out. But the kicker on all of this is water use. In many of our watersheds, so many people are diverting so much water that we're using half or more of the lowest flows in our long dry season. And if people pump all at the same time, they can and do completely dewater the creeks. Now, if you take all the water out of a coho salmon stream, you kill that whole age class, that year's production of fish. You do that three years running, and you don't have a run anymore. They're gone. A couple of points about these impacts. One, they're cumulative. They add up, and each one subtracts from the number of fish that are going to come back. Two, they're needless. They cannot be justified as necessary to produce marijuana, even if you think producing marijuana is a good thing. And three, we have ways to manage all of these problems. 
We issue permits, we regulate how people do these things in every other field which uses these things. But federal prosecutors have blocked the state and especially the counties from regulating marijuana production, making it very difficult to use the systems we've got in place to prevent these kinds of impacts. Now that federal policy choice is something that I think is probably going to change. Having said that, on the other side of that change, we face an additional hurdle, which is that the counties are going to have to create a workable system and they're going to have to implement it, which is going to mean, frankly, more enforcement of a different kind than what people have had to deal with so far. That's going to be a challenge, putting it lightly. But it's not the only kind of enforcement we're going to need to deal with. This is the Pacific Fisher. They're a member of the weasel family, about the size of a house cat. They were trapped and trapped out across the West and logging has severely um, harmed them. The largest population left in the American West is here in Northwestern California. And they're just a, a wonderful species. Unfortunately, researchers have now been able to show definitively that fishers found dead both here and in the Sierras were killed they bled out through their organs by bioaccumulating rodenticides, rat poisons. Rat poisons that make rats even easier prey for the fisher to catch. It's, a, it's an impact that's really hard to bear and frankly it makes it, it's going to make it very difficult to hang on to this species if it continues. Now, they're not the only source of these rat poisons by a long shot, but one of the biggest problems the fishers face in their very remote habitat is the giant plantations associated with Mexico-based drug cartels. And these guys do a lot of other harms as well, but the fisher kind of encapsulates the harm they do. There's really no other thing we can do. We have to find ways of keeping these guys off our public lands, off of our resource lands, and it's gonna take serious, effective law enforcement to do it. So that raises the question, if enforcement is the appropriate policy response to a problem like this, why isn't it the right hammer with which to pound all these other nails across the private landscape? I think there are at least two good answers to that. One is that we've tried that, an enforcement-led approach to marijuana production, in California for the last 35 years. And both the citizens and the state have concluded that it doesn't work and we've largely given up. We've ended that. The second is that those 35 years haven't actually controlled these impacts and in a lot of ways have made them worse. Our, our worst actors are now deep in the wilderness laying waste to our wildlife. And on the private landscape, people conceal their crops, they hide their practices and they don't seek the help they could easily get to do better. That we are dealing with these kinds of unanticipated consequences, the accidental environmental impacts of eradication, says to me that we are dealing with a species of wicked problem. Now, wicked problems are problems of relationships. They're, com they're complex, they really resist definition, and very hard to solve because they throw off these unintended consequences if you try especially to solve them with just one single approach. Far better, the literature says, to bring many diverse viewpoints together to try to anticipate so you can minimize and mitigate the harms that are inevitable in any policy change in a wicked problem. And the key lesson here is we have to take full responsibility for our actions including inaction. So we have a range of harms. We have a bunch of tools in the box. We're going to have to use them all. We're going to need different kinds of enforcement and more of it. We're going to need more education, more efforts like the um, efforts that are bringing flows back in the Matoll by encouraging people to move to winter, winter water storage. We're going to need, above all, clearance from federal prosecutors and policymakers to regulate marijuana production. Now, the moves by Colorado and Washington to legalize the possession and production of marijuana create a real crisis for policymakers, but they may open the door to us in California to get these questions more right than we have so far. I think the core of this is going to be a permitting program that lets people who will operate at a reasonable level go ahead and grow if they comply with environmental standards and with public health requirements. And that will put a floor under the worst impacts 
It'll also create an opportunity for private certification programs like organic labeling for food to give people an incentive and move their practices steadily upward and get rewarded for it. These are formal changes that we need to make, but they're probably not sufficient in and of themselves. What we also need is to transform the culture of silence that surrounds the industry today to a culture of accountability, one that recognizes making messes you don't plan to clean up and harming species who have as much right to be here as we do, not just as unfair business practices, but as threats to the integrity and the viability of our community. So what can we do about it? I think above all, if you share these concerns, please share them with the people who work for you and let them know that we do need to make changes and those changes need to include attention to these environmental impacts, which we haven't looked at anywhere in making these kinds of policies. Thanks.